We want to welcome David Smick. The author is called, the book is called The Great Equalizer, How Main Street Capitalism Can Create an Economy for Everyone. Good Sunday morning. Yeah, Steve, it's great to be here. Thanks for being with us. Let me begin with uh, an excerpt of the book. You say, quote, in economics, attitude matters. Let me begin with that. What do you mean by that? Well, I think I started to look at the last uh, decade or two, and uh, we have uh, an economic system that uh, we thought we could be easily controlled by uh, the normal macroeconomic policies. Cut interest rates to zero, and you'll have uh, an explosion in uh, new businesses and, all, and, and, and new consumption. And it didn't happen that way, because it doesn't matter if interest rates, if you don't believe in the future, and if you're scared of the future, interest rates can be zero, and it doesn't matter. You go on to say that Washington policymakers continue to fiddle with the cyclical levels of monetary and fiscal policies, but when all is said and done, a change in attitude and understanding is ultimately the thing that will raise the level of long-term potential economic growth. You go on to write, the secret of higher levels of prosperity comes down to these words, encouraging a groundswell of enthusiastic risk-taking to ignite an innovation revolution. Right. I looked at uh, a stunning, uh, about a year ago, a stunning fact, which is that half the country is nearly insolvent. Half can't afford a... $500 bill for an unexpected car or, or medical emergency, and I looked and said, you know, this is this is a uh, uh, big changes are coming politically. I wasn't surprised by the rise of Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, and I so I began to look carefully at why we weren't growing at the same rates that we had grown in the past, and a lot of it was that business startups are way off. I mean, it's great for uh, to, to ball, jawbone corporations, you know, to come back into the country. But you know, a lot of those jobs are going to be robot jobs, and the jobs that the explosion comes when small firms start up, and more importantly, when they go public. Most of the jobs come after a, a small firm goes public. Companies are finding it so expensive to go public for a host of reasons, and uh, so I began to look. Said that's really the uh, disease that's uh, that's really undermining our our economy. So, as you point out in this piece for National Review, forget about Wall Street, it's Main Street capitalism that will boost the economy. So, specifically, what are you calling for and what's not happening that you think should be happening? Well, I think the, uh, if you look at the behavior of uh, Washington policymakers and I would throw in the Federal Reserve since the financial crisis, it has been to preserve the big and the, and the, uh, and the established and the status quo because they have systemic risk to the entire financial system, but the little guy got very little in terms of, I mean, it's very hard for small businesses to get loans. They were uh, suffered, and you have uh, almost a non-enforcement of, uh, of um, uh, policies to, uh, to control the corporate sector. You look at uh, antitrust policies. I look at the, um, the regulatory situation in the U.S. and how how the small are, are uh, the, the large uh, manipulate that system to the disadvantage of the small. I mean, look at the, the centers of tech, which, you know, the, the, the major, you know, ground central tech centers of Facebook and Google. They spend more day on lawyers and uh, buyout experts to stifle competition, to control competition than they do on uh, research and development. And that's kind of a a corp I call it a corporate capitalism that has stifled the innovative spirit, and we really need to get back to a much more level playing field. And I, have, I outline in the book 14 points, things that we can do that I think on a bipartisan basis that can turn these things around. And I'll make one other point about attitude and why attitude is important. When you look at, at periods in the last 50 years when Washington could show bipartisan spirit and could solve problems in a bipartisan way, growth was twice as vigorous, twice as high as when we, were, we kind of fell into this partisan uh, uh, quagmire where both sides hated each other. So do you blame the Republicans as well? I blame both. I really do blame both the Republicans and Democrats. And I blame both parties for allowing a corporate capitalism to descend on this city. Because this this is uh, and 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 to ignore. I mean, they have part of it is campaign finance, but they, we have a system that has been taken over by the large and the little guys not getting a shot. The American people are angry. You're right, and with good reason. Their country has fallen into a slime pit of mean-spirited partisanship, 
that will be difficult to reverse. This new era of hatred has contributed to broad-based policy shutdown, stalemate, and division are two reasons for America's, quote, new normal of mediocre economic growth rates. I agree. If you look back at the Reagan years, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House at the time, Reagan, a Republican president, they saw that Social Security was about to go down, and they got together and they fixed it. And uh, neither side got what they wanted, 100 percent, but they fixed it. And I would give Bill Clinton credit during, a, during the Clinton administration. He lost control of Congress. He didn't just go and say, we're going to run a rear guard action to try to undermine uh, the Republicans. He said, look, I'm going to negotiate with them. I think he got probably a little better than he had to give, but it was a successful period. He and uh, Newt Gingrich, then the speaker, they, they, they produced the budget. They produced surpluses. When the, when, when the system works together, it doesn't mean all the time because there are differences, but when the system comes together on the important things, then this country grows. Statistically, it grows at twice the rate it does when uh, the country's tearing itself apart. You serve as uh, chief of staff to then Congressman Jack Kemp right. and uh, one of his students, if you want to call him a student, is now the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Right. Has he taken the Jack Kemp approach to his speakership? Well, he's tried. He's tried very hard to uh, to not get into the divisive. I mean, Kemp was a, a very unusual politician. He hired me. I had had a background as a Democrat, but I was a conservative Democrat. But I was nevertheless. He was not particularly. He didn't care about partisan labels, and he was a, a uniter, not a divider. And I think Paul has struggled. He's tried to to go in that direction. I commend him, but uh, it hasn't been easy. What's, what was Jack Kemp's biggest regret in politics? I think his, uh, probably that he did not, when he ran for president, he did not uh, take it as seriously in terms of the nuts and bolts of, of, of actually doing that. I, I actually think that. In, in 1988. Yeah, in 1988. I think that also, if you got to be a little strange to run for president. you got to be, I mean, to to, to go through what you have to do. People who do that are, are, are different from, from most people, most other people. And I don't think Kemp had that kind of, he wanted to change policy. I don't think he was driven by the sense of, I, I need to fulfill my destiny to be president of the United States. So there were a lot of things he just didn't do. A lot of compromises he took. He took positions that hurt him with the with the uh, with the right, frankly, in the in the in the primary season, and he uh, you know he paid for that. But I think he his his fundamental thesis, which was, you know, we can't move ahead and leave anyone behind, um, even though he believed in a growth message, was uh, I think uh, you know really something that that uh, was commendable, and it's really it was really uh, his influence on Reagan. That I think he'll be remembered for historically. He told he, I was there in the in the meetings when he said to uh, then Governor Reagan, "I want to support you, but you got to stop talking about welfare queens and all this other uh, ugly stuff that has a, a subtle racial overtone to it." And Reagan said, "You're right," and switched. And suddenly they talked about economic growth and expanding the economy for everyone. They even got into enterprise zones and things like that. So, I think from Kemp's standpoint. Uh, that's a big legacy, and he'll, uh, his, his ability to influence uh, Ronald Reagan, particularly in the early years. David Smick is our guest. The book is called The Great Equalizer, 202-748-8000. Our line for Democrats in 202-748-8001 for Republicans. Send us a tweet at C-SPAN WJ. Join us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash C-SPAN. What is the first economic agenda item that Donald Trump should focus on? Well, I think he's making a mistake uh, by focusing on Obamacare and coming out with this, you know, attaching Obamacare to the first reconciliation bill. I think he should do a uh, his tax reform uh, effort, and he should make it bipartisan. And in, in, in 1986, the last big tax reform we had in this country, it was bipartisan. I worked on that, and it was uh, Bill Bradley, people like that, or who are uh, who, who were willing to go across the party lines and come up with a, a system. You know the. The, the tax system today is uh, six times more complicated than it was after we reformed it in 86. And so you, to a certain extent, you have to clean out the barn, you know, of, of the manure uh, periodically. And I think that this is the time. And I think there's, a, there's a, but they have uh, postponed that. It's going to be on the Let's go to David joining us from Akron, Ohio, our line for independence. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say um, I have a book that, 
I haven't really uh, read it, but I, I bought it because uh, I like the concept. It was by E.F. Schumacher. It was called Small is Better. And I think he was advancing the concept of small businesses. But mm -hmm. to me, it seems small, like... Small is had, beautiful, it was. Yeah. Yeah, small is beautiful. Yeah, thank you. If we had like a, a people's bank um, where we had low interest loans uh, and it, it would be a community, uh, you know, administered, and we could we could advance certain projects. Certain projects might have uh, priority, like green energy and local agriculture. Both of those two would obviously lead lead to a you know cleaner energy. And uh, also, I just wanted to comment that I think both parties are equally uh, complicit in in the trade deals that have hurt, like Obama back and Clinton back uh, uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership. A lot of Democrats swung over and voted for NAFTA that made it happen. So I, I see both parties as being under corporate control. So uh, we do need a new populism like Bernie Sanders showed, in, in my opinion. Uh, so we can still have, uh, you know, free enterprise, but free enterprise with a community face, with a community conscience. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, th I think you um, you make some good points on the uh, – I, I agree with uh... – Believe it or not, with Bernie Sanders in this respect, the system is rigged. Now, I don't agree with his conclusion, which is, seems to be to move to a kind of European-style uh, social democratic system, which I, I spent a lot of time in Europe, but it's not very pretty, uh, and it they hasn't performed the way uh, they expected. But I would look at, um, I think that there is a, um, something that, we've, we've got, that, that Donald Trump in particular needs to pay attention to, or we need to pay attention to. The, you know, we saw in the campaign this constant uh, discussion, both from Sanders and Trump, that, um, that the, you know, we've had bad trade deals and we've had currency um, uh, manipulation, and it's true. But exports are only 13 percent of GDP in this country. In other countries, they're 30 to 40 percent, most other countries. But for us, we have a big economy, it's 13 percent. And so even if we spent uh, the next, uh, you know, four years with uh, fixing trade deals and, uh, and, and ending currency manipulation, which is a, it needs to be done, you know, we still got the other 87% of the economy, and that economy has, uh, is not doing well. It's low productivity growth. It's, we're growing at half the rate that we grew, you know, um, um, historically. I mean, if you look at this country uh, since its founding, we've grown at an average annual rate of 3.7%. Now we're growing at half that rate. So I went back and if you, if, if the economy, if the U.S. economy thought its history had grown at today's growth rates, we would not today have the per capita income of the strongest country in the world, the major economic force in the world. We'd have the per capita income of Papua New Guinea, a little tiny island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So growth matters, and it's a big, big deal. Now, you mentioned the banks, and I think that's a... A very, very interesting uh, point. You know, we can, we can, by legislation, give the Federal Reserve um, direction about um, the, uh, uh, you know, about their mandate, whether with employment and whether with price stability. And, uh, but maybe we also should have uh, instructions for the Fed that says you can't just have a system in which liquidity goes to large companies, because frankly, what we've seen since the financial crisis is the large corporations, they, um, they've been in a position where the low interest rates have been a bonanza. They have been able to borrow so cheaply, they, they buy back their own stock. And now corporate debt is going through the roof. And um, look, I'm not necessarily, I don't concentrate on populist anti-corporate uh, jargon, but the fact is during this time, the community banks and the regional banks, the workhorses for the small economy, they've been financially suffocated. And it's really, uh, it's really mis uh, unfortunate that both the Federal Reserve and the, uh, the Congressional Banking Committees didn't take a look at this and say, we've got to do something. We, get, we cannot have the, uh, the, the, you know, that part of our economy, the, 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 the bottom-up, grassroots part of our economy that's so responsible for so much growth. We cannot have that uh, dying. And I will... I will just to go back to a point in our earlier discussion. You know, we um, we concentrate in the news so much on how did the stock market do today, and we say what was the what's the growth number going to be, and that's all useful. 
But the more important thing, in my view, is something called social mobility. And I think that's really the frustration that people are feeling. It's what I talk about in my book, The Great Equalizer, here. The, the, uh, 25 years ago, a person in this country born in the, tw in the bottom 25% of the uh, income earning families uh, had a 25% chance of rising to the top 25%. Again, you're in the bottom, you have a 25% chance with hard work, determination, some smarts, a little bit of luck of rising to the top. Today, and that was my story, by the way, as I explained in the book, today, 5% chance. And people know that. That's called the American dream, and that's why people feel frustrated. They feel trapped, and they worry, maybe not for them, but they say, look, my kids and my grandkids in this kind of 1%, 1.5%, 2% economy are going to be stuck. They're never going to have that opportunity. And I, you know, I can tell them to work hard and to, and to take out school loans and to do all these all this, um, all, all this effort, but uh, I can't really tell them with confidence that they're going to go anywhere with that because of the nature of our economy. It's stifling. It's been, it's been uh, um, put in the straitjacket, and I think that's why um, we need to change policy. How Main Street Capitalism Can Create an Economy for Everyone, The Great Equalizer, the book by our guest, David Smick. Lewis is joining us, Pikesville, Maryland, our line for independence. <clears throat> Good morning. Yes, uh, yes, Steve, thank you for taking my call. And uh, I think that people like me who call, we have sometimes have great ideas, and I would like for you to maybe have a town meeting where some of the, you know, pick some of the ideas and let us get on television. Because what I have to say will take too long. But I, there's several things that have happened. Uh, I'm a black American physician, retired, and I've watched this uh, uh, economics. And for 50 years or more, they the black population has been insourced. You know, you write books about outsourcing jobs. But for years, we have been insourced. The minute we got on our feet, the immigrants came in from Europe after the Civil War and took the jobs. Then another wave of immigrants came in after that and took the jobs. So we have been insourced out of the economy, and now we're still being insourced. Most of the small businesses are owned by people who somehow be able to control our inner-city economies. I think that... Uh, uh, what's happening now is that you've insourced so much that the white male is being uh, affected, and now you, it's an issue. But for years, we have had high unemployment in the inner cities, and we have been affected. But now that the uh, <clears throat> people from other carriers are insourcing you and taking the jobs, is now an issue. I think that Theodore Roosevelt had it right when he said that the, but good, the, business is, the government is business and the business is government. So I think there's several ways you could give the lower class or the, uh, the struggling people a uh, tax rate, a tax break. Uh, why don't Why don't the businesses uh, get rid of the burden of health care and and get, make it national? It just costs businesses to have health care. Lewis, thank you for the call. Well, I think it's, it makes a very interesting point. When I look at the, when I say we need to have um, reform of the tax code, here's one reason: if you are uh, living in your in, in Pikesville, and you are going to say you want to start up uh, a dry cleaning business, and you and you're successful, and 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 then you suddenly you have five dry cleaning stores, and you employ a hundred people, and you're doing great things for the economy. It's not just about making money; you're also contributing to the community. You are part of of the success of uh, of Pikesville, and uh, you are going to pay a tax rate twice the tax rate that the guy on Wall Street who has a private equity firm, he's a billionaire, he's a private equity firm, and he's paying on the bulk of his income, which is called carried interest, he's paying a tax rate of half that amount. And I think that's why I go back to the whole question, well, that's true if economies were, you know, could be, um, could be you know, controlled like, a, like you could, and, and can be, you know, uh, manipulated through um, through an economic equation but, of but some let me, sort. Let me jump in because John Taney, in a piece at Forbes magazine, has written about you and your book. The headline is, Wall Street's War on Main Street is one of the greatest fake news stories of all. And he points out that, uh, eager to sell a book, you published various op-eds of late asking the incoming Trump administration to shift its focus to the people and away from finance. Supposedly, booming economic growth will be our reward if some of the brightest financial minds in the world are neutered. Interesting about your commentary is that he's unwittingly promoting...
cronyism that he presently ascribing to as big, bad Wall Street. I, I saw that, and I didn't know how to, how to respond. These poor Wall Street guys and these poor Fortune 500 guys who have no one defending them in Washington, oh, that's, oh, that's so terrible. I thought the whole, that whole critique was absurd. I mean, the, um, look, we have um, um, a financial system since the financial crisis in which the short-term interest rates were set at zero percent or near zero. And so people who used, the average folk who used to get, uh, you know, earned three or four percent from their money market funds now uh, suddenly earned nothing. And you say, why did we set, why did the Fed set rates at near zero percent? It did it because the bank's balance sheets needed to be repaired. And when you can, uh, when you have, uh, short-term interest rates at so, such a low rate, you can borrow for next to nothing, and then you can you can lend, you can um, you know you can buy debt at uh, at three percent and take the spread as an automatic profit, and that's what the banks did, and and it was and it worked, but it also represented a huge transfer in wealth from Wall Street to Main Street, and you can't deny that that when you when you're when you're it's bailing out the banks, not just with a federal bailout, but with the with the you know, conduct of monetary policy, you um, there is a transfer, and um, I, I think that that is a shame because we weren't sensitive enough in terms of the corporate side. I think um, um, you know Donald Trump is um, calling every corporate CEO, and and uh, he called the. The, you know, the, the carrier people and said, look, I, I don't want you to move abroad and, and all the rest. I, I have no problem with that. They're, they're interesting public relations stunts. And they, I think they're useful in the sense of he's trying to establish a paradigm shift that says, you know, we're going to concentrate on this country, you know, uh, and, uh, for once. But I don't think we should, we should distinguish that. We should got to separate public relations from economic policy. And economic policy, when you look at um, economic growth, it's, it's bottom up. I mean, we live in a world in which top-down management is fading, whether it's with, whether it's with uh, Facebook or ISIS. We live in a bottom up world in which change is happening evolutionary, particularly technological change. And that's the kind of thing, that's the change, that bottom up growth that we need to nurture. And uh, we don't need to fixate, and I, and I, I don't mean to be harsh on uh, Trump because I think he is, on, on this issue, is trying to do his best. But we got to remember, Donald Trump was, a, was a, a, a builder of Manhattan skyscrapers. And when you build a skyscraper, you deal with a plan from the top down, literally from the top. I mean, you are, it's a centralized, controlled process of building this, this entity. It is not a bottom-up evolutionary process, and, and but but that's what the economy is. The economy is not a machine where, that spits out, you know, loaves of bread. It's at, at predictable uh, rates. It is more of a like an organism that has that where cells grow and die on a continual basis. And if you have a healthy economy, you have a lot more cells growing than those that are dying. But it's not something you can easily control. And that's why I have uh, I've made this case that in terms of our public policy, we need to spend more attention to how to getting more of these cells from the bottom to grow than we need than we need to worry about uh, whether the corporate sector is protected. They will believe me, they will be protected by Washington. They have they have plenty of dough and they and the Wall Street sector will be protected. But I think we should just even it out a bit. We've been getting a lot of tweets. I just want to put three on the table and then go to a call because we only have a few minutes left. But this is one saying, do you prevent CEOs from grabbing all the money like D Disney CEO taking $46 million in salary while and play, okay. paying the employees minimum wage? And then there's this from Doral saying the job market has changed for the last 15 years. You can't go to the mill and make $25 an hour. Technology, math and science is the future. And finally, from Victor, to be able to do real tax reform, Congress has to stop uh, taking Wall Street money, no matter the consequences. So, what are you hearing? Well, I think I think they're all good points. Um, the uh, certainly the Wall Street money. You cannot deny that the Wall Street, that the Supreme Court's decision on uh, on on contribution has distorted the system. But that's that's certainly been 
the, the case even before that. But it's, um, you know, it's, I would, in this case, be bipartisan. I mean, the Wall Street money went to the Democratic candidate this time, and uh, the Democratic candidate lost. So it's, it, it's, it is, um, it's complicated, let's say. Um, on the, um, the, the second question was the, um, the nature of, of um, uh, the job market, job market. And salaries. Look, with the kind of fast-moving um, uh, information economy that we have, we have kind of both good news and bad news with the information economy. The, 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 the bad news, of course, is that artificial intelligence has, you know, is, is, could be a threatening thing. It's an economic disruptor, and it could, you know, we could be, you know, within a decade, artificial intelligence, the machine will be smarter than 90 percent of the population. So there is a fear of people being permanently put out of work. And, and, uh, but the good news is that technology is also, particularly in the information age, it's, it also gives everybody access to the future. It's not like the old days where if you couldn't, if you weren't privileged to get on the inside, you couldn't be part of the economic growth. But that requires this whole uh, a, a lifetime of education and creative uh, ad adaptation of that education. I mean, you've, people have got, we're going to have to have major online education, major um, um, programs that just step up so that people can um, be part of this, uh, of this new economy. I'll, I'll make one comment. You know, w w we tell our kids, particularly today, we say, you've got to be a math and science major uh, or a computer programmer because they're going to be the future and you'll have a job and, and others won't. And that may be true, but it may not be true because if you're a computer programmer and that's what you're studying, you're probably easily replaced by a, a machine in the next 10 years. And the same thing if, if you are, I mean, um, if, if your whole orientation is toward the analytical, you're vulnerable to a machine replacing you. Look at um, you look at a, a car today, it's 20% uh, software, and within 10 years it's going to be 80% software. And so you have this, um, this um, a, a system where I kind of wonder if the people who are going to come out on top are going to be the ones that have a creative dimension. In other words, you, you could see, um, see it with Steve Jobs and with the, uh, with the iPad. The iPad had a classical design. I mean, he, he made a big deal. I said, I don't want my thing to look like a clunky machine like the rest of it. I want it to look beautiful. And so there was an aesthetic element to it. There was a creative. And I, I joke about, uh, gee, you know, we could in you know, 10 to 15 or 20 years, we could see the uh, CEO of, of General Motors being a fine arts major because, you know, the, the, so much of the, of the analytical work will be done by a machine, certainly the financial. What can't be done by a machine, at least now, is the side, that kind of that vision that's understanding what motivates people to buy this car versus that car. And so I think we're, we're changing. I think the most important element is people realize they tell their kids or their grandkids, you've got to adapt. You've got to be flexible. You've got to, it's got to be a lifetime of education. It can't just be oh, I went to business school or I went and got my engineering degree. No, this is, you, you've got to stay one step ahead of a machine. The book is called The Great Equalizer. Our guest, David Smick, thank you very much for stopping oh, by. It's we great. appreciate it. Please.